You are listening to a sermon by Pastor Christopher Sally of New Life Christian Fellowship Church. As you can imagine and as you can anticipate, we're going to continue to walk down the phrases that are in Psalm 23. And we spent time talking about the Lord being our shepherd and what that means and and trying to pull out based upon uh, our knowledge uh, collectively uh, around what shepherding, particularly in the Middle Eastern areas, it's, it's basically the same all over the world, but particularly in the, the, the Middle East because of the arid climate, because of the mountainous ranges, and there are some special things that happen with shepherds that David would be aware of, amen, because David was a shepherd, and we know from Psalms 100, it says, we are the, his people and the sheep of his pasture. So the, what we're trying to do is look at, at sheep and shepherding and make application to our lives as believers for encouragement, for chastisement, for recognition, to think about some things differently that we may not have appreciated about the care and the compassion that we have from our Lord who is our shepherd. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures and we talked about how important that was for sheep he leadeth me beside the still waters sheep don't like to drink from moving water and that means that the shepherd has to be prepared amen to move the move the flock around he restoreth my soul that's where we landed the last time we were together we talked about the fact that sheep get cast amen we talked about the fact that sheep have little legs they got the kind of body type that if they, if they flip over, it's hard, for, like turtles, I guess. It's hard for them to turn back over. They got those little legs and, it, and, they're, and, they're, and, they're, and those fat bodies. And what happens is if a sheep gets cast, there are gases that begin to build up into the first chamber of their stomach called the rumen. And if they can't get themselves upright, those gases will build up and it'll cut off uh, circulation to the extremities. And particularly if it's hot, they don't have much time uh, and they, and they get cast very often. And again, predators are always looking out for cast sheep. That's just, that's just easy. They already don't have any real uh, defenses, but a cast sheep with its belly exposed is in a very dangerous position. So a shepherd always has to be on the lookout for cast sheep, hopeless, without strength, those that are dejected and vulnerable. And the interesting thing about, uh, about the shepherding process is that when you see a cast, when there is a cast sheep, there is, as they say, in, their time is of the essence. Amen? When the shepherd comes to get you when you're cast, he comes to get you. He's not coming to get you to give you a, a lecture at that point about how you got cast. He's coming to rescue you, but we'll get a debrief when we get back to the sheepfold. But I, I have to uncast you when you are cast. Amen. And so we praise God that that we have a a, a shepherd that restoreth our souls. And so again, cast sheep. And I told you there are three reasons why sheep get cast and we only dealt with one of them and so we're going to deal with the other two and then move on from there sheep can be cast for three reasons the first of which was that as we talked about because they are seeking places to get comfortable they're little rounded out indentations that they may find some place where they can just kind of lie down amen and it's there's nothing wrong, I think, with the desire to lie down or the liar, the desire when you're satisfied from, from feeding to find a shady spot. But you have to be careful that you don't get into a soft place. Come on, somebody, an easy place. And after you've had your fill of things for a while, uh, and, and for us, the application is many times we get cast because we're comfortable and we stop working. We say that we've put in our time. We say that we have done enough. As Pastor Mark has just retired from the Chicago public school system and from teaching for 37 years, that's good. I tell you, when you retire from work in this life, 
hopefully you get a pension, but you don't ever retire from kingdom work. Matter of fact, it's time for the kingdom work to pick up. Amen. You got more time to do kingdom work. So again, until God calls us home, we work. Amen. And, and, and if we get comfortable, we can find ourselves cast. And, and so again, there's a, there's, a, there's a lack of hardship that can happen when you are, when you are cast. And, and, and so that's why God in his infinite wisdom says, I, I, need to, I need to get your attention from time to time and let you know that in this life you will have trouble. Yea, and all that live godly will suffer persecution. He says you need to suffer. It talks about in First Peter chapter 2, but he said you do it like the Savior did it. You, you do it in such a way that you bring glory to God. You do it in such a way that, that, you, that you carry the reputation of the kingdom, but you should expect to have hardship. Amen? If you're too comfortable, the problem with being comfortable is you could get cast, and if you get cast... Trying too hard to relax and take a break, you can find yourself in a very dangerous position. It can also happen with the challenge of material possessions. You want to know why sometimes God doesn't give you everything you want? Because he knows you. You say, nah, I would. Yeah, you would. Yeah, yeah, you would. He says, I, 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 need to, I need to keep your face on me because sometimes when we get what we want, we transfer our trust from the provider to the provision. It's one thing entirely to trust God when you're waiting for something. It's another thing to trust him after you've received it. That's where the real trust is. That's where the real, that's where the real challenge is. Just ask Abraham. It was one thing when you're waiting for 25 years to get that son. It's another thing when you have that son and God says, trust me, I need you to sacrifice your only son here on this mountaintop. And Abraham was able to do that and demonstrate faith because Isaac asked him, I see, I see the fire, I see the wood, but where is the sacrifice? Abraham said, the Lord will provide. <laughs> So that's, that's what we call gangster faith, amen? You know what I'm saying? That's, that's, that's that kind of faith that you and I have to have where you never get comfortable that there's hardships in those tests. So again, the, different, the difference between a test and a temptation is the author and the intent. A test comes from God and it's designed to make you step up. A temptation comes from the enemy and it's designed to make you step down. It, the test comes from God to be a building block in your life. The temptation comes from the enemy to be a stumbling block in your life. And so, again, we, we, don't, we, we joy in tribulation. We joy in tests because it tests our faith. If there's no hardship, we will never have any maturity. Amen. God wants to mix humility with hardship. The humility will allow you to understand your need for God, and then that hardship will, will grow you up so you'll understand that you need to progress in God. Amen? And so don't get too comfortable because you might get cast. The second reason that, <laughs> that sheep get cast is because they have too much wool. <laughs> I, I don't know how it happened, but uh, it got into my Facebook feed. I saw a sheep that had not been sheared. It looked like in years and years and years, and they brought the sheep in. You couldn't, he, couldn't, he couldn't even really move. You couldn't see his eyes. You couldn't see anything. And once they, they kind of got through all of that, it, it, it was a, a different story. But it was, his fur was so, his wool was so matted down. It had so, much, so many burrs and dirt and mud and all of that stuff that gets that gets packed into you I told you already that and you recall that sheep's wool is is like a magnet amen it's the lanolin I believe that's in their wool that, that it becomes like a it's like velcro it attracts all of the all of the dirt and the grime and if if they have too much wool they they might end up getting cast that means it's not like they they um excuse me it's not that they're full they're fleshly amen it's a fleshly thing. And you think about wool for you and me, that, that would be thinking about the world. We can, we can get 
matted down by everything as we traffic and move in the world. We, we pick up some of the world's stuff. Amen. And that's why in Hebrews 12 and 1, therefore, since we are surrounded by so many, a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us and let us run with endurance the race that is marked out for us. Again, there is weight that is not all, all sin is weight, but all weight is not sin. Amen. But you can traffic and move around in the world and you'll start to pick up some of the world's stuff. And unless the shepherd shears you, you are at risk for being cast. You think it's fine to have that much rule. It's like, you know what? You're fleshly. So the first one says, the first reason they can get cast is because they're full. The second reason is because they are fleshly. The first is a lack of hardship. The second is a lack of worship. Because when you start to traffic and move in the world, if you don't get cleaned up by the shepherd, you start to reflect the world. You start to think like the world. You start to pursue the things that the world tells you are so important. And you are not worshiping your God. You're in, your worship is not here. Your worship is in your circumstances. Your worship is in your power and your prestige and your possessions. And if you get to that place, beloved, trust me, you will get cast. And have you forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as sons? Hebrews 12 again. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Amen. Discipline to help the fleshly. And last but not least. They're full, they're flesh, fleshly, or they're simply fat. Amen. Sometimes they just get, again, the way their bodies are shaped, you just can't put all of that on them little legs. And, and when you put all of that on them little legs, it, they sometimes they just, they run, they fall down, they tip over, and then they just can't do what they need to do. That's not a lack of hardship, beloved. That's not a lack of worship. That is challenged by a lack of discipleship. Amen? So again, Hebrews 12, 5, and 6 talks about this discipline that is needed. That's for both the fleshly and the fat. Amen? They're fleshly, they're full, or they're fat. They are not pursuing the disciplines of a disciple, and they're literally out of shape. Amen. If we don't have disciplines in our lives, what are the pursuits that God has told us that he wants us to have? There's there's daily Bible reading and and there's daily prayer and there are devotion and 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 fellowship. Those are the disciplines of a of a disciple. And if you and I are not pursuing the disciplines of a disciple, don't wonder why you are carrying more weight than you used to carry. Don't. Don't wonder why your discipleship pants don't fit like they used to. Don't wonder why your discipleship dress just moved up a size or two. The one that you ordered, come on somebody, that just came in the mail that you tried on and you trying to think, well, maybe it's because it came from China that maybe their size six is not a size six. And why, why is it now a 10 instead of a six? Maybe it's just because it don't fit like it used to because you're not doing what you used to do. Nothing tells you your state like when you put on your clothes. You can fool yourself, but if, if, if it doesn't fit, you must, you must have quit. I'm, oh, I'm, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I went back to 95. Wait a minute. I'm sorry. I, that's, that's my bad. That's my bad. I, yeah. If they don't fit, you got to get a different size or, or do some work. That's, the, that's really how it's supposed to end. But quiet time and prayer and fellowship, Bible study, the discipline of tithing, amen? The discipline of how you honor God with your money. All of those things are, again, this, this, 
this lack of discipleship that we have. And for this reason, it says in 2 Peter, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall. In increasing matter, measure, if we, it's love on top of a godliness and, and uh, brotherly kindness and love and self-control and perseverance. These are the disciplines that we need to be pursuing. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to fit into our discipleship clothes. And when you and I stop fitting into our discipleship clothes, it's because that we are lacking in the area of discipline. The good thing, though, is Jesus restores us when we are cast, even when we did it of our own free will and suffer because of it. Amen. He does not leave us out there. Uh, but approaches us and restores us like he did Peter in John chapter 21. Oh, I love that passage of scripture. I'm sure you love it too, as you remember, when when he tells uh, the ladies, he said, go and tell my disciples and Peter that 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 I've risen again. Why tell Peter? Because Peter was the one that denied me three times. Peter was the one I told him before the cock crows, you'll deny me. He said, I'll never deny you. He said, yeah, actually, you're going to do it, and you're going to do it in about about 35 minutes. You're going to do it, and you're going to do it three times. You know how dejected Peter had to be, especially when it all worked out, when he does come back from the grave, and they're, they're so excited, and he says, go and tell my disciples and Peter. And so when they finished eating, he said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you truly love me more than these? He says, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs. Simon, son of Jonah, do you truly love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. So take care of my sheep. And then the third time he said it to him, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said, yes, you know I love you. You know us all things. And he said, feed my sheep. He restored him three times because he denied him three times. And he wanted him to know, you're fully restored. I came after you. I see you. I love you. I need to give you another chance to to understand what the assignment is. I need you to take care of my lambs. I need you to feed my sheep, and I need you to do it. And you have the ability to do it. You're the right man for the job, and I'm not going to cast you away just because you were cast out. Because you cast yourself over, I'm not going to cast you away. I'm going to bring you to myself. I'm going to restore your soul. I'm going to dust you off, give you a new assignment, and tell you I You're still the right man for the job. I know that you love me, and I need you to now demonstrate it by feeding my sheep. Isn't it powerful to know that God can still use you after you've messed up? Now, if you've never messed up, then you don't know what I'm talking about. But but I suspect you might have messed up somewhere in your life and I know that there might be a time where you had to come back to the shepherd or the shepherd had to come after you and he had to tell you okay I understand where you are but you still have value to me I'm not going to turn you immediately into lamb chops just because you messed up otherwise there would be lamb chops everywhere we pastors often when we get together we laugh because we say to shepherd our desire is to to shear the sheep but other people in the congregation they don't want to shear the sheep they just want to slaughter the sheep just slaughter them they mess up just that's it for them but if you got a shepherd's heart, you say, no, let's, let's not slaughter all of the sheep. Some of them, sh- okay, let me, let me, okay, let me, let me get off of that. Let me get off of that. We do need some lamb chops. 
And that's, like Forrest Gump says, that's all I'm going to say about that. We do need some lambs. But, again, he restores my soul. Thank God we have a God that does just that. Amen? Woo! He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I thought I was going to be able to get all the way to yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I'm looking at my timer, and I know that's not going to happen. But we're going to get into this. He leadeth me. Come on now. In the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. See, you have to understand that sheep, I'm talking about, talking about you. I'm talking about sheep, but I'm talking about you. Sheep are destructive. Did you hear what I said? Sheep are what? They're destructive. You are destructive. Amen. Sheep are hard on the pasture, and they're hard on one another. <laughs> if left to themselves, they will cause great destruction. Uh, since they are creatures of habit, they tend to stay in certain spots, and these favorite areas will become infected with parasites. Why is that? It's part of the reason that they're destructive is, as I told you, they fertilize as they go. Amen. Y'all know what I'm talking about. They fertilize as they go. If they keep hanging around in the same area and they fertilize as they go, the, if, you, if they stay too long in one area, it allows the, the uh, parasites to complete their life cycle and then begin to in, 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 infest them. Amen. The other thing is, if you don't keep, if they stay in the same place, they will eat the grass, as I told you. Not like cows do, not like goats do. Sheep eat all the way down to the root. They literally don't leave an opportunity for the grass to recover and grow. If they stay in the same area, they'll eat it all the way down so there's literally nothing left. This book that I uh, was reading by Philip Keller that really talks about uh, a, a, a shepherd's view of, the, of uh, Psalm 23. He is a pastor, I believe, but also he is a liter was a literal shepherd, amen. So again, he understands these things very viscerally and, and is able to kind of give real, real context to it. And so to be able to say that if you have a shepherd that doesn't keep his sheep on the move, and if they stay in the same area, you can look over at that sheepfold and you can look over at that pasture and it's just browned out and it's, it's messed up. And he says, you know, he remembers kind of like the sheep look looking through their little gate, looking at his sheep that are thriving, that are doing what they're supposed to do. Because it, it's, it's more than a notion to move sheep around because sheep are stubborn and they want to do what? They're stubborn. And they want to do what they want to do. And they don't mind eating, eating in the same thing, grass that's filled with parasites and they don't mind drinking from muddy water it's just their it's literally just their nature they can't appreciate the consequences until they're right up on top of them amen so there's many things that you think you can endure there's many things when you make a decision you say i can handle this but you don't realize until later that you have been infected with fluke worms and nematodes come on somebody and there's all these other kind of problems with infections that happen and you didn't even realize that you picked that up based upon a decision until it plays out like brother tim would tell us play the tape all the way out we very rarely play the tape all the way out we like to stop the tape at the fun part the part that we got drunk with our friends at the party. We don't play the tape out when you're standing there with the cops and it's like, now walk this line here. And now you got a DUI. And you needed that, you needed that car and that driver's license so that you could go to work. Now you done lost your job. All because you had big fun with your friends. Play the tape all the way out. Sometimes there's some consequences that you cannot appreciate. So again, sheep are destructive. And soon the flock can be infected. So the solution is from the shepherd, you have to keep the sheep on the move. You have to keep the sheep on the move. 
and a shepherd has to have a predetermined plan of action. You just don't willy-nilly keep the sheep on the move. You have to have a plan. You have to be able to inspect the pasture. You have to know where you can move them to and allow the other parts to recover. You have to have enough pasture land. So praise God, our God is the one that has the cattle on a thousand hills are his and everything that's in the earth is his. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell within. So he has the resources, amen, to be able to move you where he needs to move you to give you what he needs to give you in order for you to thrive not just to survive but to not just to strive but to thrive he knows what he's doing and so sometimes he says we need to move from this place because otherwise this this earth this grass will get stagnant you'll eat it down you'll be destructive and you'll start to be destructive not only to the environment you're in but you'll start to be destructive to one another because as the food starts to to get uh, minimized amen then you begin to fight among one another so I got to keep you on the move because it's what's best for you. So think about that implication for ministry. So now we're talking about the challenge of stagnation. And I'm not saying that God literally has to move us from a particular place. But as I think about the history of our church, we had to get away from Grace and Glory Chapel. We didn't want to, but circumstances made it so that it was three years and we had to find someplace else to move to. Then it was eight months at Roseland Christian School. And when I was preaching this 17 years ago, I know that's where we were. Had no idea where God was going to move us to. Had no idea that there was a building that we would buy probably five, six months later. But what the Lord told me is you got to keep sheep on the move. He said, I've got to keep you on the move so that you do not become stagnant in ministry. Unfortunately, we have become stagnant in ministry. And that doesn't mean we need to put a for sale sign out and go find another building. It means we need to be on the move. Jesus said in John chapter 5, uh, I do nothing by myself. I only do what I see my father doing. For whatever the father does, that's what I do. Jesus says, I'm, I'm always working. And I look to see what the father is doing, and I join him in his work. When is the last time we've joined the father in his work? When is the last time? I feel like, and I know in my heart, and you know it too, we've become stagnant. We become full. We've had a lack of hardship, probably a lack of worship, definitely a lack of discipleship. We have been cast and need to be restored. We have not been on the move. We have been, I don't want to say destructive to one another because I don't, I don't really feel in my, in my spirit that that's our issue. But this, this word that I wrote down was stagnation. Stagnation as a ministry. There's some good things that we used to do and that we don't have the opportunity to do anymore, but we got to find some new pastor, y'all. And, 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 and the thing about, a thing about the shepherd, and it's, it's part of my job, it's part of my responsibility, is that we have to be on the move. There's got move. There's got to be a fresh word, fresh revelation, fresh experiences, fresh ground. Those are the four things. Fresh word. Fresh revelation, fresh experiences, fresh ground. All of our experiences in the body of Christ and in this ministry, and I'm not saying that they are, but if all of our experiences are what happened back in the day, that's a problem. If we can't talk about what happened earlier this year, if we can't talk about how we got our worship on and how we sang and how we danced like David danced, if, we, if we're talking about that like it's 15 years ago, that's a problem. We should be talking about that like it happened, yay, even this morning, which it did, amen? That, that should be our testimony. It's always something fresh. There's always something new happening at new life. We're 20 years old now. I don't want to change the name of this ministry to Old Life Fellowship Church. Old Life Christian Fellowship. It just doesn't have the same ring to it. You know what I'm saying? Come to Old Life Christian Fellowship. Mm, come to New Life. Y'all not with me. Okay, Old Life then. I will just change it. I'll, I'll get everything. Change the sign, change all of the stuff, and it'll be Old Life Christian Fellowship. That can't be our testimony. That would, that would be a 
submission to stagnation. And that's an issue in ministry. And this has application to both our collective and our individual uh, experiences. And this is where we're going to camp down for a second. Because if you don't stay on the move, I mean, I were talking about stagnation for a, for a church body. And that's important. That's f- important for us to know. But this, this idea that he leads me in the paths of righteousness. There are too many people who claim the name of Christ that do not desire to be led. That's not about stagnation. Beloved, that's about submission. I don't want to be led. The only place he's going to lead you is into paths of righteousness. I'm not interested in being righteous. I'm interested in doing me. I don't want to be led. I'm going to stay right here. I'm going to eat here. I'm going to crap here. I'm going to eat here. And I'm going to drink here out of these muddy pools. He says, you don't know where the good clean water is. You don't know where the good pasture is. But you got to let me lead you in the path of righteousness. You cannot go with God and stay where you are at the same time. Listen to the language when Jesus says to his disciples these two simple words. Follow me. I can't stay here and work with on my dad's boat if you're Peter and James and John and those the, the, the ones that initially uh, that got called. And he said, but you got to I will come with me, follow me and I will make you what fishers of men. And the scripture says they dropped their nets. They dropped what they had and they followed him. You cannot go with God and stay where you are at the same time. If you are a follower, you follow. And that means that you are at the will of the shepherd. You are submitting to what the shepherd wants. That is the hardest thing in life for you and for me to do. We want to do our own thing. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and stay where he is no take up his cross and follow me he can't lead you if you don't follow why because he's given you this this thing that trips up everything that we do all the time it's called what free will He says, I'll lead you, but you got to lead sheep. But sheep have to also learn how to follow. The only way that you learn how to follow the shepherd is because you trust the shepherd. It's because you have confidence in the shepherd. You've seen the dangers and the toils and the snares, and you've seen what happens when you get cast when you're away from the shepherd. You know how important the shepherd thinks about you and how he comes after you and how he protects you and how he keeps you and how he cares for you and his compassion. And then when he says, let's go over here, you say, let's go. Because he's going to lead me into the path of righteousness. He is going to lead me where I need to go. Even if I'm walking down into a cistern to get this still water that he will provide down there. Even if it's steep, even if it's dark, I trust the shepherd because he's come through for me time and time and time again. His resume is spotless. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. But you know, if you follow him, it's going to come at the cost of personal riches. It's going to come at the cost of personal rule. And it's going to come at the cost of personal relationships. You know that. Because that's what our Bible shows us in Luke chapter 12. That's what we understand from Matthew chapter 16. If any man will come after me, he's going to have to, he said, and if a man don't, doesn't love his, uh, he loves me more than he loves his mother and his father and sisters and brothers, he can't be my disciple. You got to have a what? You got to have a surpassing love. Come on, somebody. You have to have a surpassing love if you want to be Jesus's disciple. He says, again, in Luke chapter 14, he says, and whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me can't be my disciple. I can see him. She's like, Jesus is like shaking his head. I can see him kind of walking around. Can't do it. Can't do it. 
I, 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 can't, I can't have folks that claim to be followers that don't follow. So if you, if you come after me, you have to be able to do what? You have to be able to bear your cross and come after me. Otherwise, you can't be my disciple. When it talks about bearing the cross, in Roman times, when they, when they gave you the cross, they made you carry your own cross when they were crucifying you because it showed that you were submitted to their rule. You, 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 your understanding was getting ready to go down, and you, you have no choice in it. You're submitting to it. And so he says, it's not only going to come at the cost of personal relationships that you have to put, you have to have a surpassing love above all. It, love me more than you love anybody else, amen? It's, a, it's also got to come, it's got to come as a surrendered life, amen? And that's going to come at the cost of personal rule. You can't be in control anymore. When I say move, we move. Just like that. That's what he's looking for. He's not looking for a discussion. He's not looking for you to write a dissertation about it. He's saying, when I move, you move. Just like that. That means that that comes at the cost of your, your personal rule. And the last but not least, he says, so likewise, whoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. I need a sacrificial loyalty that will come at the cost of personal riches. So personal relationships, personal rule, personal riches. I need a surpassing love. I need a sacrificial loyalty, and I need a surrendered life. That's what I'm looking for. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. He says, I'm trying to lead you in the paths of righteousness. But you need to follow me to get to those paths of righteousness. Otherwise, you are going to stay in these pastures of mediocrity. You're going to stay in these pastures of destruction. Every decision you make when God says, I need you to move, and you say, nah, I'm good. I'm going to stay here. It's going to be a problem. That's what God is trying to show you and show me. But what I love more than anything and don't miss this. Do not miss this. Because as important as you are to him, he not doing it just for you. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. How many times... <laughs> How many times when you left out of the house did you get a lecture from your mother or your father about listen, or before we go into the store, listen, don't touch nothing, don't ask for nothing, don't make a fool of yourself and me by extension when we get in here. And she would basically say, or what they were saying is, listen, my name is on you. You are Sally. You are Tyler. You are Little. You are McNutt. Amen? My name is on you. Because cause when, when they call up from school, they're calling me. So when you act a fool and you're in detention, part of the reason your parents were so upset is because if you had a, if you had a different name, maybe they could let you get away with it. But, but, but. But that's the name that's ringing out, and it's not ringing out because you're the top student. It's not ringing out because you play the clarinet solo in the band. It's not ringing out because you did the great debate on the debate team. It's ringing out because you acted a fool at school or you acted a fool over here. Nah, I'm going to come get you. I'm going to make this thing right, and it don't have nothing to do with you. I'll deal with you later. But for my name's sake. I'm going to set this thing right. For my name's sake, I'm the one that's going to go down and, and talk to the principal. For my name's sake, I'm going to be the one that goes and talks to the store manager after you done knocked over three displays with, with clothes on them. I'm the one that's got to go and say, now, he was raised better than that. We're so sorry. We're not like, that's my name's sake. They don't have nothing to do with you. God says, my name is excellent. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Who has set thy glory above the heavens? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings has thou ordained strength because of thine enemies that thou might steal the enemy and the avenger. And he says at the, as it concludes in Psalms 8, he says again, Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. He says, if I'm going to put my name on you, I'm expecting you to carry my rep the way that I carry my rep. That's what Moses was appealing to in Numbers chapter 14. 
when, when the Lord said to Moses, how long would these people provoke me? How long would they, uh, would they err to believe in me? For all the signs I have shown them, I'm going to smite them. I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than thee. Moses said, Lord, don't do it. And he, he said it not because he was going to do it, but he wanted to gauge, I believe, Moses' reaction to it. Moses could have been like, it's about time because I'm tired of them. Let's blow them up and start over. That would have been the wrong answer. Moses said, don't do it. Because if you kill all of these people, then the nations which have heard of thy fame will speak, saying, because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which he swear unto them. They would be able to say, Lord, you brought them out, but you couldn't bring them, bring them in. He said, your rep is on the line. Your rep is on the line. You don't want anybody to be able to say that you couldn't do what you said you were going to do. You brought them out but couldn't bring them in. He said the Lord is long suffering of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity on the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation. Pardon, I beseech ye, the iniquity of this people according unto the greatness of thy mercy as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt unto now. He says your name is great. Your reputation is that you're forgiving and you're your loving and your loving kindness extends for generations he said don't do it it's your name it's your rep it's on the line and so God was able to deal with that same children of Israel why for his name's sake you get all the way to the end of time and you get all the way to e Ezekiel chapter 34 and you see that God does the same thing. He said, y'all been playing with my name and messing with my reputation all this time. So guess what? He says, I'm going to give you a new heart and I'm going to give you a new mind. I'm going to clean you up and I'm going to do it, ch children of Israel. You are going to actually obey me. The fact that I have to do a heart and a mind transplant is just part of the process, but I am doing it. It says in Ezekiel 36, I believe it is, for my name's sake. I said I'd do it. I said you were my chosen people. You're going to obey me for my name's sake. And he says, I will lead thee in the paths of righteousness for my name's sake because you're my people. You're the sheep of my pasture. I am looking for you to be obedient, and so I am going to chastise you, and I'm going to give you course corrections. I'm going to come after you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to discipline you. I'm going to do everything that I need to do so that your, you as a sheepfold will move where I tell you to move. I will get this done, and I'll get it done because I love you, yes, but I'm going to get it done because of my name. We can't be in his sheepfold and not be his people. He's going to do what he needs to do. And so that should make you excited, but it's also make you a little scared. You ain't going to run around here talking about you a follower of Jesus Christ and not follow. He going to stop that. You're not going to be able to just say, oh, yeah, I, I love the Lord. He heard my cry. Amen. I love the Lord. Hmm. You love the Lord, but you don't do anything that he says. But if you're his, he'll come after you. That's what Hebrews 12 says. He will discipline you. He will chastise you as a son. And he says, who de despises what an earthly father does? He says, so, so get it together. Strengthen those feeble knees. Amen. Because I've got some, some work to do because you're naturally selfish. You're naturally destructive but I need to move those impulses out of you so I can get you where you need to go. And the thing I love so much is he said he's going to lead us not into the path of destruction, to the path of righteousness. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into that same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord.
He says, I, I, I want to move you to a place where you see the image of Christ and you're changed into the image of Christ from glory to glory. It's a progression. That's what sanctification is about. There is a positional sanctification. There is a perfect sanctification that we'll have in the kingdom. But in the meantime, in between time, there's this progressive sanctification where we're turned more and more into the image of God. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. That's the job that God is doing when he is leading us in the path of righteousness. He says, I'm trying to get you to be more Christ-like. And I'm not going to give up on that project. And I'm not going to give up on you. Why? Because I'm able. I'm able. And I can do just what I said I would do. I'm going to fulfill every promise to you. Don't give up on me. And I'm not going to give up on you. He's able.